from the high desert and the great American Southwest, I bid you all good evening and or good morning wherever you may be across this great land of ours. From the Tahitian and Hawaiian Islands in the west, nestled in the warm trade winds of the Pacific, eastward to the Caribbean and the U.S. Virgin Islands, with their own soft winds, south into South America, north all the way to the Pole, and worldwide on the Internet. And by the way, hello to my friends down at the Antarctic. That's McMurdo. This is Coast to Coast AM. I'm Art Bell, and it's great to be here tonight. We are going to talk tonight about one of my favorite topics in the world. Maybe my favorite, actually. Time travel. In the first hour, I'm going to talk to time travelers. You. Those of you out there who claim to be time travelers. Now, in the second hour, we're going to have actually a very serious guest on time travel. David Anderson, Dr. Uh, David Anderson, Ph.D., is a former United States Air Force officer, flight test engineer, and scientist. Yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O'Culture, where it will forever be midnight in the desert. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. We've got a hell of an episode for you this time around. We're going to talk about one of my favorite topics in the world. Maybe my favorite, actually. John D. And who better to do that with? Then Jason Louvre. He's in the house to talk about D and his work, which he says shines light on the secret history of the world. Jason is the author of five books, the latest of which is John D and the Empire of Angels. This is the story of the one and only Dr. D, who, as Jason says, sought to reverse the fall of mankind and return all of nature to God to create a new Eden by prompting the apocalypse. Moreover, it is the story of Dee's angelic system, the men and movements it influenced, such as Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry, the Royal Society, the Golden Dawn, Aleister Crowley, and Jack Parsons, and how it not only changed the world, but in many ways created the world we now inhabit. Indeed, just as the work of St. Paul is responsible for turning the ideas of a Jewish messianic sect into a holy Roman empire, so is the work of Dr. D. responsible for turning those of the Protestant dissenters into a global empire of angels. So what the hell am I waiting for? Let's cast this pot off deep into the sublunary world where the only message we're waiting to receive doesn't come through a smartphone. It comes through a mirror. Enjoy. Pencil. Jason Louv, thanks for being here, man. Yeah, yeah, thank you for having me on. I'm super excited to do this, and um, I really want to thank you for for doing your show, too, and and the listeners. I mean, I've been checking out a culture that seems like you have a really, really uh, well put together and well thought out and well, you know, very precise and deep podcast here, which is great and not very, very common. So I don't I don't see that very often. So I, I really wanted to congratulate uh, you for putting this together and the listeners for being into this topic, which is, you know, obviously the occult is not a light subject. It's a huge amount of intellectual and work. It's a life pursuit. You know, society often doesn't look on it very kindly. So it's not a light thing to do and, uh, you know, to take spirituality into your own hands. So that's awesome for everyone who is pursuing the great work, who's listening to this. Well, shit, man. I think we should just end the show there because that was that was way too kind of you to to say all that. <laughs> but I do appreciate that, man, for sure. 
Well, uh, I have to be I, kind, you know, because the yeah. occult is not easy, you know, so <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> it's good yeah. to be kind to people. Uh, Absolutely, you know, that's man. kind of the, the yeah. point of the whole thing in a way. Once you understand that uh, the uh, not just the, you know, I would say the harshness of the path, but the only thing that's really harsh about magic is that it it exposes you to reality with the blinkers off and it shows you what reality is without the comforting illusions and, and lies that people tell themselves uh, to anesthetize themselves. So, you know, when we're, when people are into the occult, it, that can be quite jarring, but my hope is that they come through that experience, that kind of abyssal experience with great sense of uh, compassion for other people. Yeah. I think I'm still working on that. To be honest, it's been a, it's been a tough, uh, probably three year process for me since I really first discovered the work here. And I definitely met that shadow version of myself, which I've talked about on the show a few times. And it's, it's been, a, it's been an interesting journey so far, but I do appreciate your time and your kind words. I am trying my best. And I think that's, that's all I can do. So I also wanted to welcome Ulysses, one of our earth patrons on Patreon to the show. He's hanging out with us for the day. Thanks for being here, man. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, so just want to point this out. 20 bucks a month gets you a chance to sit in on these calls from time to time. And this is the first time we've been able to do this, so hopefully I, I don't fuck this up too badly. But we have a lot to get through, a lot to talk about. So, Jason, you know, let me compliment you. You're one of the more impressive magical thinkers that I've come across in recent years. You've worked and written with uh, Genesis Peorage, and you teach magic at magic.me, among many other things. But you're here because you've written, I think, the definitive introductory text to the life and story of John D. called John D. and the Empire of Angels. I know this grew out of an article for Boing Boing and then a short ebook, but I'm glad you gave this story the full length treatment. D's obviously a fascinating figure, and I think the pre sales of your book can give us some sort of indication of the appetite that people have for his story. So let's start here. Where did sure. the interest in D specifically come from? And why did you write damn near 600 pages about him? <laughs> All right. Well, let's just get straight into it. And and I think the best place to start there is, you know, my story and my path and how I came to this. But yeah, I mean, def thank you for the compliments on the book. Uh, it has the pre-sales. It comes out April 17th. And the pre-sales have been very, very strong, which I'm super grateful to for and, and you know, all the people who are so interested in this, which I was not expecting. What that means, however, is that the first print run has already, you know, damn near sold out for, to the distributors and from the distributors. And because the, the first print run was much smaller, they were not expecting this uh, level of interest. So what that really means is it's probably the first print run is probably going to sell out almost immediately uh, upon release date. And then there will be a second printing and there may be a gap in time before that shows up back in the back on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm really recommending that if you, if you are interested uh, in this topic and as you become interested in it, uh, as we're talking about it, definitely order it and grab that first edition because, you know, as we all know, hardcover occult books go up in value. They sell out and they go up in value on the secondhand collector's market because there's such a fierce kind of competition for this. That said, okay, that out of the way, I just wanted to uh, bring that up since you did mention <laughs> that, and I yeah. want to make sure people actually get this book and read it. All right, that aside, so I've been interested in magic for 20 years, and I started off as a teenager, and I wanted to, you know, I was a very skeptical and hard-headed and, you know, cynical and even sarcastic, you know, goth kid, as, you know, many of us were, and I got attracted to the idea of magic because I read a book called The Occult by Colin Wilson, where uh, Colin Wilson says that there is this thing that he called Faculty X, which was this special something that hum some human beings seem to have and be able to tap into. And he asked, why do some people become geniuses? Why do some people like John Dee manifest this almost supernatural ability to shape the course of world history? And then he became interested in the occult as potentially a methodology for awakening and unleashing this faculty. And that became utterly fascinating to me. And so I became very involved in, you know, trying magic out, getting results. Uh, this was, of course, you know, the mid 90s, the late and then the late 90s. So kind of a heyday of chaos magic. And I got very, very involved in the occult world very quickly, you know, joining groups and meeting Genesis Peorage and studying under Jen for, you know, seven years and, uh, you know, I was the books editor of Disinformation, and I, and I got myself into all these adventures. 
at the time, the dialogue around the occult was really dominated by the idea of chaos magic and, you know, the work of Phil Hine and Peter Carroll. And then, of course, you know, Grant Morrison was extremely popular. And the whole idea with chaos magic, as I'm sure, you know, most of your listeners probably know, was this idea that you didn't need to follow the rules. You didn't need to, you know, you could throw out Kabbalah. You could throw out, you know, these hundreds of or thousands of years of tradition going back to, you know, Paleolithic cultures and just make it up on your own. And something about that didn't sit well with me. It seemed quite disingenuous. And and frankly, it really just seemed like an excuse to not do work. It seemed like an excuse to not actually go investigate that stuff. So you can't become a freeform painter or a freeform poet without learning the rules first. And so I became fully immersed in hermeticism and, you know, the Golden Dawn and, and, and uh, of course, also spent many years traveling around the world, you know, up into the mountains in the Himalayas, learning yoga at the feet of yoga masters, uh, you know, staring out over cloud banks uh, while doing yoga. I became initiated as a Nepali shaman in Kathmandu, you know, sacrifice chickens everywhere and things like that. And, um, you know, studied NLP, Freemasonry, Sufism, all kinds of things, because I wanted to, I wanted authenticity. And the reason that I say all this is that because after, at this point, 20 years of experimentation in every single branch of magic that I could immerse myself in, and not in a way of just reading about it in books and doing, trying to repeat recipes out of recipe books, as, as often people do with the occult, but going and finding those living traditions and, and immersing themselves in, in, immersing myself in them as an anonymous participant, I, you know, after 20 years of that, of, of beautiful and horrifying and transcendent and demonic and angelic experiences, I really, I have to say that Enochian magic, you know, which is the magic that was transmitted by John D, uh, at least within the broader spectrum of the Western magical tradition, is strikes me as the most potent and majestic and and fundamentally disturbing in some ways and destabilizing to the ego and the sense of personality uh, form of magic that I've come across. It's the, kind of the real deal. And I've come to the conclusion, or I, I came to the conclusion around the mid-2000s when I first started immersing myself in Enochian, that when we look at things like the Golden Dawn and Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry and Thelema and things like this, what we're really looking at is, and this is my contention, and people might argue me on this, but what I believe we're really looking at is systems of training wheels or scaffolding that small groups of adepts or esoteric thinkers have built around the inner core of Enochian as ways of preparing people for the Enochian universe and the Enochian experience. And I think that's fairly well borne out in particularly the case of the Golden Dawn, which you can clearly see the inner order teachings were all Enochian, and then all the Kabbalah and tarot and Egyptology and stuff like that was really built up on top of the, the bedrock of the Enochian system. And so, you know, I've now had, I think, well, at least since 2004, 2005, I've been you know, immersed in Enochian, and it truly is the most complex and bizarre system of magic in the Western canon. And what I've discovered is that not only has it formed the core of all of these esoteric orders, you know, the, the inner court, as it were, but that in many cases, it has been causally responsible for creating them. And even more than that, that when you go back and you look at John Dee, who, of course, was the person who, with the aid of, of the psychic Edward Kelly, transmitted this system over the course of about seven years, and you study who Dee was in context and the context of where that system came from, which you very rarely, if ever, get from occult books. You have to dive into academic texts to discover this. What you see is that this thing called Enochian, and with John Dee and his work, in studying it, it becomes like peeling onion layers off. You peel uh, off layer after layer of this mystery until you get to the core, which is like the, the dark grail in the Chapel of Abominations, as it were. This dark grail in which you are able to scry in the darkness the history not just of 
magic and the occult and spirituality, but the core of what it means to be human, what it means to be a soul incarnated on this planet, what it means to to be alive in this present modern world, why the world is the way it is, why everything has been so apocalyptic, why the wars are happening, why you know why the empires have happened, why the British Empire happened, the American Empire. We're talking about starting to understand 500 years of history and you know why the world has been brought to the edge of environmental degradation and collapse and apocalypse at the point of empire and that's what you get from d and and you realize that when we look at john d we're seeing the man who invented the phrase the british empire we're seeing the man who laid down the naval schematics and specifics that allowed england which was then a tiny impoverished nation to become the greatest empire the world has ever seen the empire on which the sun never sets and from them, the, the American empire happened. And so the age of empires and all of the horror and also development that has brought the world. And with D, we're seeing the person who brought math, you know, higher mathematics to the public. We're seeing the person who laid the groundwork for the scientific revolution by modernizing the scientific knowledge of England. We're seeing a man who's standing at the crossroads between the Middle Ages and, the, and, of course, in the Renaissance and the Age of Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution. And so with D, we're seeing somebody who was right there at the key moment of history and in many senses could be said to be causally responsible in many ways for creating the modern world that we live in right now. And then who spent seven years talking to angels who told them that it was the end of the world and that he had to use all of this scientific and imperial groundwork that he had laid to bring about the end of the world so that Christ could come back sooner. And, you know, and then it keeps going from there. And we, we see that in, in studying D and in studying Enochian, we're not just getting a new system of magic. We're not just getting a more complicated way of doing Kabbalah, right? We're getting the context of everything, in my opinion. And, and that's both profoundly beautiful and, and, and terrifying, you know? And as I'm recording this, as, as we're having this conversation, it's the day after the United States um, has begun bombing Syria again. And if you, if you understand this history, if you understand why America, uh, why not just England, but na- next, you know, the British Empire, but then the American Empire has been consistently engaged in wars in the Middle East and destroying civilizations, destroying Babylon and now Syria, the cradle of civilization, you begin to understand the history of the apocalypse and and the history of people like D and the politicians who followed his line of thinking, who have for 500 years believed that it has been their sacred duty, their magical mission, if you will, to hasten the end of the world, to accelerate the events of the book of Revelation uh, so that Christ will return and establish a worldwide Christian empire, which is what the angels wanted. And we can get more into specifics on that now, but uh, or later in the podcast. But I don't want to overload you too much because we're covering a lot of territory here. <laughs> yeah, you uh, have uh, you have presented quite the thesis statement. Very bold, very provocative. But I, I think we'll be able to pull out and show people that yeah, this is all pretty accurate. But before we talk about D himself, you know, we should talk about you kind of alluded to this, the world that he was born into, you know, you described it in the book as a chaotic and fractured world and a world that he would seek to repair. You also said that if the angels did speak to D, they chose the most dramatic time possible to reinsert themselves into the story of Christendom. Now, I think it's important to mention the work of Pico della Mirandola as it relates to this world that Dee was born into. I know that you know of Pico's work, but for those who don't, how did his work lay the foundation for what was to come with Dee? Yeah, so this is just absolutely critical to understand because for most people, when we're learning about Hermeticism and Kabbalah and things like this, we're, we're learning about it through the lens of the Golden Dawn and the people who followed on from their thinking, which, as we now know, was you know not particularly historically accurate. It was quite beautiful in its own right. But to understand Hermeticism, we have to understand what it was originally and where it came from. And it was from the Medici city-states during the Renaissance. So you have to understand that Europe for hundreds of years was, of course, in the Dark Ages. There was, you know, no access to any type of intellectual tradition, you know, following the fall of Rome into darkness. And uh, for the most part, there was the church, and it was the church's job to, you know, shepherd the spiritual and intellectual life of 
uh, Europe. And so uh, Europeans live, for the, for the most part, um, outside of small breakaway uh, heresies or kind of pagan survivals, Europeans lived with one story about what the world was, which is, I would, I would say, almost impossible. But I think it actually is impossible for us as modern people to understand or conceptualize. There was one story, and that was the story that the Christian church said about what reality was. And, uh, of course, you know, literacy rates were uh, basically almost non-existent except among the educated uh, clergy. And the clergy was reading from Latin Bibles. And usually there was one Bible that the clergy read and then interpreted to tell people stories from. But they might not have even read it either, depending on, on where we're talking about. So this situation changed very dramatically in the 15th century during the sack of Constantinople, where Constantinople, which had been the capital of Christendom, which is now Istanbul in Turkey, uh, was sacked by the Ottoman Turks. And what we now think of as the Greek Orthodox or or the Russian Orthodox Church or the various other Orthodox churches uh, lost their capital and were destroyed. I mean, this is when you look at old images of beautiful churches with mosaics and gold lettering, gold gilt uh, images and icons, what you now see in, in Orthodox churches, that was this whole city. It was a, a truly holy and gilded city, and it was, it was destroyed by Ottoman, the Ottoman Turks. And what happened was a lot of the Orthodox priests fled to the Medici, the Medici city-states in Italy, taking with them all of the, what manuscripts they could save from this, this burning uh, Holocaust. And a lot of the manuscripts that they brought with them were manuscripts from ancient Greece and Rome and things like they brought uh, the works of Plato and Aristotle, for instance, back into Europe for the first time in several hundred years since the the fall of Greece and Rome. And of course, the Medici city-states at this time were a tremendously wealthy and powerful elite. It was the beginning of the the middle, middle class. You can think of them very much like Silicon Valley today, where it was this tiny kind of city like San Francisco uh, or city states that just had tremendously concentrated wealth because of their mercantile early capitalistic endeavors far above and beyond anybody else, much like Silicon Valley and the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world today, right? So they had all the money and all the influence and all the time, and they started studying this stuff. And for the next several hundred years in Europe, the the overwhelming intellectual project of Europe, and this was what sparked the Renaissance, was that uh, Europeans wanted to just understand what they had lost. They had not got to science yet. They had not got to the idea of finding new knowledge. They wanted to uncover the knowledge of the Renaissance. And so it was at this time that two people, Pico de, uh, della Mirandola and... Um, Ficino? Yes, yes, Marcelo Ficino. Okay, thank you. So these two guys kind of started going through this, and they started going through not just... There was, of course, Neoplatonism was born at this time, which was the study of... Plato and Aristotle, and the understanding of the world as a series of nested essences, which is an idea that's not particularly popular in today's modern occult discourse, which is, I, I disagree with. But Neoplatonism was the, the study of, you know, the universe as a series of nested essences. And with that, they combined the Hermetica. They started studying the old Hermetic texts, which had been around since, you know, the time of Christ and, and inspired by the Gnostic scriptures. And the her- Hermetics of course, were the study of the universe as one thing, as the idea that the universe is kind of a computer that makes perfect internal logical sense and, and can be understand, understood experientially. You know, I think actually, the, the, as an aside, the best way to understand Hermeticism is the, the infamous Morrissey lyric, uh, nature is a language can't you read, <laughs> from I think a Smith's, a Smith's song, right? That's, that's Hermeticism in one line, right? It's the, the idea that nature has its own internal logic, and for instance, a red gemstone is similar to the planet Mars, is similar to a red five-petaled flower, and that you can understand language the language of nature as a not just a series of essences, but a, a, as kind of a one consistent computer. But with this, they included the teachings of the Kabbalah, which had been brought to Spain by Sephardic Jews who had fled to Spain, uh, fleeing persecution. And, uh, and then, of course, were, were then persecuted during the Inquisition. Um, uh, it was a shameful period in Europe's history. But they, so they combined, combined Neoplatonism with Hermeticism, with Kabbalah, with the grimoires and the grimoire tradition that had been, these grimoires had been floating around Europe and into the idea of operative magic. And this was Cornelius Agrippa and his mentor Trithemius and the most famous work 
at this time was the three books of occult philosophy by Cornelius Agrippa, which modern occult students still study quite a bit. Crowley studied it, Spare studied it, people still read it today. And so what they were trying to do was meld all these things together and create a science, if you will, or a method, at least a method, for not just understanding reality as a you know, as a computer, if you will, as with its own internal logic, but also to be able to change that, to be able to work with it, to be able to work God to modify and manipulate the world. And this was the idea of operative magic, which was controversial even for people who were studying Neoplatonism and Hermeticism. But of course, it's from this mishmash that we inherit the modern occult. These ideas were became critical to the European intellectual elite. And the overarching goal was that people wanted to not only uncover the original knowledge of humanity, but uncover their pristine native state of enlightenment, if you will, and become enlightened magicians able to work with God in, in manipulating the world. And, and John Dee studied this stuff, and to my mind, and I think it's pretty hard to argue this, Dee is the most brilliant and advanced and forward-thinking student and really the exemplar of this entire hermetic tradition, the guy who took it the furthest and got the most success, particularly when you consider things like the transmission of Enochian and, for instance, the creation of the British Empire. And, you know, it was well thought of at this time that these, it wasn't that people were just learning these disciplines because they wanted power or knowledge. They were learning them because they thought that their application would be essential to healing the fragment, the, the, the broken nature of Europe. It was the Protestant Reformation. The church was falling apart. People were very confused. Uh, they were confused by Protestantism. They were confused by the fact that we had just discovered that the earth circles around the sun and not the other way around. There was poverty. There were plagues. People felt like it was the end of the world, and so the Hermetic tradition was very concerned with not just the individual enlightenment of its adepts, but that those adepts would then be able to heal the world, and by healing the world, what they really meant was hastening the apocalypse and bringing about the events of the book of Revelation, and in, in many senses, what we inherit from this thinking uh, is not just the modern occult, but also modern science, because the idea that you could procedurally manipulate uh, nature to get certain results outside of the bonds of the church is what created modern science. Uh, it simply just became more materialistic. But we also inherit centuries of geopolitical thinking from Columbus, who wanted to colonize the New World because he thought that he would find the Garden of Eden and that this would uh, hasten the creation of a Jewish state and the, the apocalypse and the second coming of Christ, but also the creation of the British Empire, the creation of the American Empire, the creation of the state of Israel, uh, the founding of the American space program through Jack Parsons, but also the modern Republican evangelical right who is still living out this script. And, and you know, the core I think that one of one in it's either one in four or one in three Americans currently believes that we we live in the final age of humanity and that Christ will come back in their lifetime and that therefore it's you know things like actively trying to preserve the environment or make the world a better place or futile a human folly because Christ is coming back anyways a problematic idea and that in the case of high-octane Republican o operatives, for instance, Ronald Reagan or George Bush Jr., uh, Jerry Falwell and Jerry Falwell Jr., or Mike Pence in our current administration, many of these people have thought that it is their sacred duty to hasten this and bring it about. And, and now they're playing not just with scrying balls and uh, magic rituals, but they're playing with nuclear weapons. So understanding and bioweapons and chemical warfare and drones. And so... You know, in writing this book, I, I spent three years writing this book, and the image that I kept having as writing this is, I'm sure you remember, uh, you know, in the original Star Trek, right, that sometimes the ship would go terribly wrong, and they would have Scotty crawl into the tunnels, uh, or Scotty and Kirk crawl into the, the, uh, the, the service tunnels in the Enterprise to try and find where the wiring had gone wrong. This is what I was trying to do in writing this book. I wanted to crawl into the deep coding and the service tunnels of Western civilization and figure out what had gone wrong and why things were so consistently going off the rails 
and becoming apocalyptic and horrific and and now not with the the weapons of the renaissance but the weapons of the 21st century which are capable of in a flash destroying all life on earth many times over i would say you definitely accomplished that mission after reading this book and i do like tracing this line of the scientific i guess progress that comes out of that the era of Pico and then D. I actually have a quote here from the guys over at the History of Alchemy podcast. I don't know if you guys have, have heard that show, but they did a, a show on Pico a few years back, and he was really the guy, like we said, who sets the stage for D's work and was also maybe the best example of this syncretic approach to knowledge that maybe we can talk about later too. But the quote that I have from them is this, D was born into the world of angels and demons and died in the world of Kepler and the beginning of reason and true science. And you just encapsulated that in what you just said and then and then we can also trace that progress you know up to the modern day of that just that scientific evolution of thought so going back to d himself his exploits as a grown-ass man are legendary and we'll obviously get more into them but i don't think a lot of people know what his early life was like and you do a great job giving those years and his family life you know some character and some context so i'm curious what stood out to you about d's early years and his family life while you were writing this book do we see the development of his curiosity and his vast intellect do we see that during those formative years yeah, absolutely. And so, so let, let's just take it down a notch, I guess, you know, and, and, you know, I've talked about this broad kind of epic mythology, but who was D really in the, in the, you know, the most material sense? So John D lived in the 16th century and he was essentially a proto scientist. He was an academic and somebody who spent most of his life scouring Europe for books and and, and scientific and mathematical and occult knowledge to try and piece together the secrets of nature, uh, much like a modern scientist would do w- just with, you know, a very different set of tools. And then, of course, his actual position in the world was that he was the astrological and scientific advisor in the court of Queen Elizabeth I uh, in the, you know, the era of Shakespeare, the Elizabethan era, and that for most of his life, he was essentially a, an underpaid government consultant to the queen who was consistently experimenting, experimenting with occult methods in his own personal life, but from whom we inherit this set of incredibly dangerous ideas such as uh, the ones I've just been talking about that have been kind of running the show for a while. But D himself, you know, he was born into uh, not not particularly well means. His father was a he was a like a textile merchant or a gentleman sewer who was had minor connections to court in providing them with fabrics. And but D grew up in in his parents' household, uh, immersed in mathematics because his father was you know, engaged, was a merchant, was engaged in keeping books and numbers. And so he, he lived in a world of numbers. And he went to into this, he was recognized as a, a incredibly bright student from a young age. And he went through the English school system and to Cambridge, which at that time, as I touched upon, was completely interested in humanism, which was the study of the classics and Plato and Aristotle and trying to uncover the wisdom of the ancient world. D was not particularly interested in this, or he was interested in it, but he was much more interested in discovering something like what would become procedural science. So he was interested in mathematics, in optics, in hard student, in, in hard science. And we would recognize him today as a STEM student, right? He was kind of a STEM student who would was stuck in like a liberal arts education, to, to use modern terms. Um, and so to get the scientific knowledge and occult knowledge he was craving, he had to go to uh, Europe to study on the continent. And he studied with all the great intellectual masters of you know, and learn geography and geometry and optics and, and the occult. And for him, it was all one thing. It was just the study of, of the world and the study of nature. And then he, he ended up bringing back a lot of that knowledge to England and establishing his library at Mortlake in southwest London, which at that time had five times the books of uh, Oxford and Cambridge. Or Oxford and Cambridge at this time had about 400, uh, two, 250 to 400 books and manuscripts each total. And D had 2,500 at Mortlake, which he spent his entire life going into debt just to buy books and was constantly poor because he was spending all this money on books to <laughs> assemble this library. And he claimed that his library was later sacked and burnt during the angelic sessions when he was on the continent with Edward Kelly. But he, he claimed later to the queen that his library totaled 4,000 volumes at its height. And it was that library that became kind of the intellectual salon and hub for a lot of the people who went on to 
do things like invent the telescope and lay the groundwork for the Royal Society and for science. So, so he was a great teacher and educator and encourager of what you might consider the technical, scientific, and mathematic-minded people of, of England, which was all of this at this time. Mathematics was seen as the black arts. You know, it was, it was seen as occultism. All of the people were quite afraid of all of this stuff. It was kept sub rosa and hidden behind closed doors uh, in many ways in the same way that the occult is, you know, the pure occult is now. Where do we find D actually really getting into traditional occult studies? I I think it might have something to do with, I don't know how to say his name, but this uh, Guillaume Postel. Was that the guy who really sort of took D's occult studies to the next level? Yes, that was definitely, uh, Postel was definitely one of his primary mentors. So these were the guys that he was studying with in his early 20s. And when he was in Europe, he encountered a lot of hermetic and occult thinkers that he learned from. And he encountered these kind of ideas that had been floating around the European underground uh, that would form the basic assumptions, not of only of his work, but of the occult going forward. And these were ideas like, for instance, alchemy, not as some vulgar art of turning lead into gold, but as a spiritual, step-by-step spiritual method of perfecting the human soul. Or the idea of the Ur language, that there had been some primal language, primordial spoken tongue that had been that had been spoken by humanity before the fall of the Tower of Babel, that had been, or before the, the fall from the Garden of Eden, that was spoken by angels, and that if people could just discover this language, they would not only be able to know all the secrets of nature, but also be able, and also be able to speak with angels, but also be able to manipulate late nature. And so the quest for this, you know, is something that, that Postal impressed on him very deeply, and that would really be realized in, in his work with transmitting the Enochian language later. But he studied with, with all of these occult teachers in his 20s, although it's important to point out that for D, all the way up until his early 50s, the occult was largely an intellectual pursuit for him. It was something that he was reading about, that he was formulating theories about, that formed the matrix of intellectual assumptions that went into his work. But he wasn't exactly practicing it. And when he did, he couldn't get results. And at one point in the late 1560s, he writes in his diary about contemplating suicide because he keeps trying to contact the angel Michael, the archangel Michael, using you know methods from Cornelius Agrippa, and he can't get it to work. And he interprets this as a spiritual failing on his part, perhaps that he's not worthy or he's not pure enough to get it to work. So he's he's despondent because he's what we would recognize now as a kind of a hyper-rational IT type person who doesn't really have, in, in his case, doesn't really have intuitive psychic faculties. And so in his early 50s, he starts to get more into the direct study of magic and, and getting it to, to work. And he realizes that in order to do this, he has to employ scryers. And, and scryers are kind of like modern psychics. It was a whole profession in, in England. They were kind of itinerant fortune tellers that wandered around the countryside offering to do, you know tell fortunes or divine information for people. And the, the way that they did this was by using a crystal or a small piece of scrying glass and basically staring into it as a self-hypnosis process until they started to trip out and entering an, what we would now recognize as a trance state or an altered state of consciousness in which they would have experience, you know, deep material welling up out of the unconscious that would, you know, that they would interpret as direct spiritual contact with spiritual reality and that they would then use to pronounce fortunes or to do acts of magic just like a shaman would using other tools, you know, whatever method people use to get into a trance state. You see that some form of that methodology in every single shamanic culture in the world. But in England at this time, it was scrying. It was this idea of staring into a crystal, which in our modern world, we inherit, you know, that very cliched stock image of a fortune teller staring into a crystal ball, right? Which is, you know, just like the, the most cliche of the most cliche occult image. But that's a survival of this tradition. And uh, Dee became fascinated with this. And of course, we also see in the modern world, we always see cartoons of a wizard with a robe and a pointed hat with stars and moons on it, staring into a crystal, and that's the archetypal image of a wizard. Well, it's quite possible that those images are actually a survival of propaganda images later created to mock D. So the, the, that image comes from D. They were, it was a caricature of D because he, you know, he began to try out scryers, and then finally he went. He used a guy named Barnabas Saul. 
and then uh, with some false starts. But then he meets this infamous and very dubious uh, and apparently very talented scryer named Edward Kelly. Uh, and the two of them formed a working relationship where it was the combination of Dee's intellectual knowledge about the occult and Kelly's ability to go into these trance states and scry and access visionary material in whatever way he was doing that, that produced what we see as the angelic conversations. Yeah, man. Okay, so before we get into that too deep, I wanted to circle back to the hermetic worldview because you mentioned something in the book that I wanted to sort of pick apart here. We know that the hermetic worldview has a lot to do with, you know, energy and vibration. And you mentioned something in the book called Stellar Rays. And the amount of detail that you put in the book about this particular subject, just it's, it really blew my mind. And I would really love it if you could tell us a little bit more about that here, because it does sort of inform, I think, this natural form of magic that Dee and Kelly are, are trying to perform here. Totally. So there's a, actually a really, so this comes from a book called The Propodumata Aphoristica, which Dee write, uh, it, was, it was his first book. Um, that he wrote after completing his his master's degree, in which he lays out his kind of theories of the occult. And what I point out in the book, and I'll make this very simple in a second, what I, what I point out in the book is, in our modern occulture, if you will, you know, and when people are investigating the, the occult in our modern day, for the most part, they do it a little bit tongue-in-cheek, and I think that modern people are often too come from a too rational background and are too kind of postmodern and self-aware to immerse themselves in the occultism in, in occultism while truly believing that it is an actual physical science, right? Which is what D was doing. And you know, when people get into the occult now, they'll talk about it in terms of, oh, well, this is personally meaningful to me, or they'll they'll use phrases like Jungian archetypes or communicating with the unconscious or you know, they'll talk about it as an artistic process and they'll psychologize or even psychologize away magic as some type of kind of like kooky personal art therapy project, right? Or it becomes just a like a, a set of uh, social signifiers, right? It just becomes a way to, you know, uh, become a cultural outsider. And I think that's actually what we see a lot of in the occult now, which is where people take on this idea of a kind of a persecuted identity. Well, I'm a, you know, I'm a witch or I'm an occultist or I'm a Satanist. And they do it as a way of rebelling against the dominant culture, particularly in the U S I don't think this is, people get this as much in the, in the UK occult world, but in the United States, we still live in a, you know, a very Christian evangelical culture in most parts of this country. And so you often in the occult see people who have grown up in evangelical households who rebel by, just becoming the opposite of what their parents believe, right? Okay, so that aside, and we do have to set all of that aside in understanding D, because there's none of that in D. There's no psychologizing of techniques. There's no social signifiers. There's no rebellion against anything. What he's trying to do is figure out the laws of nature before the dawn of science. And what the conclusion that he came to at this time was that to understand how God manifests the world, you have to understand light. And of course, the first line of Genesis is, you know, let, or one of the first lines is, let there be light, fiat lux. And so the assumption was, you know, if, as the Bible tells us, that God creates by light, well, could we not observe that mechanism in action by actually observing light? And could we not work with that to work with that process? And so... This is not something you see in the modern occult. But to, to simplify this, to make this very clear, so if we think about, okay, an astronomer would want to study outer space with a, with a telescope, right? They would use the optical instrument, the, the glass instrument, you know, the glass optics of a telescope to, to investigate outer space, right, to magnify outer space. And, you know, later, of course, these are all inventions that largely come out of this time period or a little bit later or, or possibly a lot later in the case of the microscope. I, I don't remember. I think a lot later, actually. But with the, with the microscope, you would use a, an optical glass, a different type of optical glass to see smaller, right, to look deeper into nature, to see bacteria and molecules and, and so on. So by the same token, as Dee argues, to investigate the divine part of nature, you would use a scrying glass. Just in the way you would use a telescope or a microscope, he thought that the scryer's optic ball uh, or optic glass, the, the, the crystal ball, if you will, could be used to investigate 
the spiritual aspects of nature, which for him he thought were quite material and physical, that they could actually be observed. You know, this is what we, we might now argue to be a mistaken hypothesis uh, scientifically, but his hy- hypothesis was that if you were to uh, examine light using a scrying ball by, for instance, using a scrying ball to focus the light from another planet, you know, Mars, let's say, that you would be able to, or, uh, you know, in the sense of astrology, right, the whole fundamental assumption of astrology is that the planets and the stars affect our destiny, right? Again, a pre-scientific idea. But D argues, well, if the following earlier thinkers, he argues that, well, look, if the planets and the stars actually are affecting us, there must be some physical mechanism at work there where their light rays are actually hitting us and there must be something there that is, there must be some spiritual reality there that we can literally investigate. So we, he wanted to investigate astrological emanations and rays just like you would with a telescope or microscope, but in this case it was with a scrying ball. But then he goes on to argue from that, well, look, if you can observe them, you can probably concentrate them too. So why couldn't you, for instance, concentrate if you could observe the astrological rays from Mars, why couldn't you concentrate them into, for instance, a Mars talisman and then be able to do what we might call magical things like that in a truly scientific and mathematical way that he hoped to be on it, put on a, you know, the, the basis of hard material science? Why couldn't you do that to work with the forces of nature directly as a magician. So, uh, so that's his thinking, and that's uh, that type of thinking we don't really see very much in the modern occult. I mean, he he takes it from there's an earlier hermeticist named Alkindi uh, who wrote a book called On the Stellar Rays, where he he begins to advance this theory, and then D kind of takes it further. But Alkindi is is so strong in this thesis that he says that everything in the you know that the, the fate of all human beings is determined by the stars and he even goes so far as to say that you know your will like what crowley would call your will true will or willing or things like that that you, you even acts of will cannot influence your destiny that it's completely preset by the stars but that if someone were to you know the rarest of individuals was to you know, learn how to physically interact with and work with those energies in this type of way, then they would be able to change uh, their destiny. And that's kind of what Dee was trying to work up at that time. Uh, But of course, it wasn't, again, it wasn't until his 50s, the angelic sessions uh, and the scrying that he did with Edward Kelly, because again, he couldn't do this stuff himself. It wasn't until later that those, those theories kind of came to fruition and they came to fruition in a much different way than he thought they would. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you mentioned Al Kindi here because I was going to ask about him, but you pretty much covered exactly what I was going to ask. But I guess I am wondering now, though, what does that tell us about the nature of magic from a mechanical perspective? I mean, does it tell us anything? Is it all physical? Is there no mental component to it whatsoever then? Well, I mean, of course, when we're talking about magic, we're talking about, I mean, let's just be clear, we're talking about totally subjective things and we're talking about things that have been completely discounted by modern science. And of course, what that means is that whatever experiences people have when they enter the the occult world, which as I say in the book, you know, the, the world of magic in the occult is a place where scientists, if not angels, fear to tread, right? And you know, I'm sure many people listening to this podcast have had tons of experiences w- with the occult that they can't just say that's not real or that was just in my mind. But the thing about the occult is what I argue with, what I, at least what I argue in this book, is I say that John D. really represents the point, the kind of the last stop on the train before the tracks diverged, right? Before material science and spiritual inquiry, if you will, were divorced. You know, he was still living at a time when those were the same thing. And so what that kind of means, and this is one of the reasons, by the way, that D is so important and so important to study, is that he kind of remains the intellectual high water mark in investigating the occult in a real scientific way. Because since D, since the scientific reformation, the occult has been relegated to the wrong side of the tracks, if you will. And and the only people that have really investigated it have been cultural outsiders, for the most part, with some exceptions, or you know, people with a with an identity playing an identity game or playing a subculture game in the same way that Crowley was, for instance, and not scientists that were trained to D's level. I mean, when we look at D, we have to look at you know, a modern example would be if you imagine somebody like Stephen Hawking 
who goes through 50 years of his life and is recognized as a brilliant scientist and has won all these accolades and then says, you know what, I'm going, now that I've learned everything that I can from physics, I'm going to dedicate the next years, the the next 10 years to smoking DMT and trying to talk to aliens, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of the deal with D. So the reason that I mentioned this is that, you know, with D, we A, have the high water mark of magic, but we also have the high water mark that was not done up to full scientific standards and that was abandoned following the scientific revolution. So in resurrecting D, it's kind of like trying to resurrect calculus if it had been completely abandoned after Leibniz, you know, and trying to understand it in context. Uh, So it's a big job. So you mentioned Trithemius earlier, and D actually comes across one of his texts in early 1563 that really would influence and inform his work from then on. What was that text, and how exactly did D, I guess, interact with it? So this is a, a kind of a fascinating, great secret a- secret agent story and very cool like adventure interlude here. So Trithemius was a Benedictine abbot who became interested in the occult, and he was the teacher of uh, in Germany, and he was the teacher of Cornelius Agrippa. And he wrote this infamous book called the Steganographia, which was very similar to uh, the Lesser Key of Solomon or the Galatia, which people are probably familiar with, uh, in as much as it was a list of demons and spirits that you could conjure to perform certain tasks, one of which was the transmission of messages over a long distance. And the idea there was a ritual included in the book that you would, at a certain time, write a message on paper under candlelight and then, and then evoke a demon to carry it perhaps to another continent even, uh, to somebody who would be doing the same ritual at the same time and the demon would make the message appear on the paper in front of them. It's amazing the lengths that people went to before they had text messages. So this manuscript was of extreme interest to the British, or excuse me, not the British at this time, but the English Secret Service, which was just getting started at this time. It was, you know, had been created by Sir Francis Walsingham underneath Elizabeth, and D was instrumental in, it was an intelligence agent, and was instrumental in building up the English Secret Service, what we now uh, you know, what, what we now know as MI5 and MI6. And D's code name in the Secret Service was actually 007, uh, which is what he signed his all his letters to Elizabeth with, and that's, of course, where Ian Fleming gets James Bond's code name. So D was sent on a mission to the Netherlands to try and find this book and was was funded to actually given a significant amount of money for you know for once in his life by Walsingham to try and find this book because they wanted this ritual to be able to communicate at long distances, which shows, by the way, that the level of, you know, the interest in magic was not unique to D. It was throughout all levels of society, from the poorest people of England to the upper echelons of the, of the English court. You know, like there was a lot of interest in this stuff. And they also wanted this book because there was a lot of cryptography in, uh, information in it. And they wanted the cipher that it, it had been written in in order to encode messages because, of course, at this time they were engaged in a Cold War with Spain and the Catholic bloc in Europe, which would soon escalate into a hot war. Uh, So Dee spent many years trying to find this book, and he eventually found it in a library uh, in, I think, Utrecht or in the Netherlands somewhere, and had to copy it by hand over, he was only given like 24 hours or 48 hours to copy it by hand, so made a hand-copied manuscript. And this is the book that, of course is the root of the modern occult tradition in, in many ways, in as much as that it was the sought-after book and the book that uh, inspired Agrippa, who later went on to inspire not just D, but the Golden Dawn in, in every one sense. But he, he got a copy of the book, and I believe he either... I can't remember if he broke the cipher or he went to some lengths to getting information from the cipher because, of course, he was a cryptography guy also. But they did they did get the rituals and he did bring them back to Walsingham, which they were quite, quite happy about that. But this is a controversial book because actually it was still encoded. It was still in cryptography uh, until the 1990s. And it wasn't until the, I think, 1996 or the mid-1990s that two separate cryptographers, one was Jim Reed's at AT&T Labs, uh, and then a second researcher broke the cipher independently at the same time with no knowledge that the other one was working on breaking the cipher. <laughs> and, and two paper, as, you, as happens, right? So, so they yeah. both broke it in the mid-90s. 
It, it was written up in academic journals. And the interesting thing that happened from that is that people who had been fascinated, you know, academics or researchers that had been, or occultists who had been fascinated with this text and unlocking its secrets like it was the Necronomicon or the Voynich Manuscript or something like that, decided because it was all cryptography, you know, they, it had all these long tables of angels and demons, just like you see in 777 or the Galatia or something like that. They decided that since it was proven to be cryptography, then it wasn't an occult text. There was no magical valid- validity to it. it. All this occult stuff was just a cover for intelligence cryptography, which which also people in the 1600s said was the deal with D. They argued that Robert Hooke of the Royal Society argued that all of D's occult work is probably just a cover for intelligence ciphers that they're pretending to be doing occult rituals so that people kind of don't take it seriously. But actually all those names of angels and spirit tables and all that are actually cryptographic ciphers for actual intelligence information that they're transmitting uh, for Elizabeth or Walsingham or whoever, whoever. And that's, that's still quite possible. However, I argue in the book, and, and this was also argued by, this was originally argued by the, the quite infamous uh, occult troll Joel Barocco, who who did Chaos Magazine in the eighties and 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 nineties, that you know just because it, okay, first of all, just because something has a cipher, doesn't mean that it's not actually an occult text. Because as you know, as all the listeners will know, I mean, occult people are almost invariably interested in secret codes and cryptography and things like this. Uh, and you have to learn secret codes and cryptography to do magic. I mean, you have to learn Kabbalah, you have to learn Gamatria, things like this, if you're in the Western tradition. So just the fact that there's encoded material doesn't invalidate it. And and Joel Barocco actually argues, you know, what the deal might have been was that, and I love this, is that it could have been, that it could have been an occult text pretending to be a uh, cryptography text pretending to be an occult text. Right, so that there were three <laughs> nested layers. So on top, you have a layer of a, what appears to be magical information, which turns out to be a cipher. But then once you break the cipher, what you get is real occult information, right? Not intelligence information. And he argues that the reason this might have been, following some of Trithemius' notes, is that it allows plausible deniability, right? Because if he, you know, if some if the church finds it and accuses it of being some demonic text, he can say, well, no, it's actually just cryptography. And if intelligence people find it and say, this is a a coded text, you can say, well, no, I'm just a a conjurer. You know, no, this is just a book on magic, but that actually the real material would be hidden underneath. So I do think it's a little curious that, you know, just because something is decided that there's codes in it means that there's no valid occult information as an aside. Right, right, man. Yeah, that is so fascinating to me. I just love that bit in the book. So, you know, you talked a bit there, too, about Dee's geopolitical work, and he really gets more into that in the 1570s and this is where he formulates the idea for a new world empire, the British Empire that, that you already talked about. And you also said about that time that it was a cold war for a new world and that an omen of this came in 1572 when a new star appeared in the heavens. What happened then? Yeah, so there was actually a supernova uh, what we now understand was a supernova in 1571 and then a later uh, similar event in the mid 1570s. So there was this kind of blazing star in the sky above above England that just stayed there, I believe, for months. And uh, as you can imagine, to somebody coming from that mindset, you know, from still a very superstitious and fearful and religious mindset, I mean, that's kind of a big deal, right? So they interpreted this star as to be the Wormwood star from the Book of Revelation, and they interpreted it as a clear sign that the end of the world was at hand, right? And of course, this was coming in the context of the the war between Catholics and Protestants, which, you know, prior to the ascension of Elizabeth, Queen Mary had been queen of England and had been burning Protestant heretics at the stake in public square. And the whole, all of London was filled with the stench of, you know, melting fat and the sound of screams. And uh, it was a very vicious and brutal time. And people like Dee, who was concerned with the advancement and evolution and enlightenment of humanity, were not, you know, were quite rare. As I would argue, they are still quite rare, you know, in our modern world as we record this as bombs are falling in the Middle East again. And and so it was a very apocalyptic and, and infernal time in a way. But Dee was the person who really came to the conclusion you know, at this time, all of the monarchs of Europe were in a kind of cold war 
to discover the secrets of alchemy, not in a spiritual sense, but in the sense of they, they still believed that it would be possible to turn lead into gold. And whoever figured this out first would have an infinite store of, you know, economic might and therefore be able to win the war, uh, the Cold War, and to be able to uh, dominate the other European powers. D was the person that clued into the fact that what you really wanted was not uh, alchemy. What you really wanted was the alchemy of the world, which was uh, the alchemical process of turning England into an empire and conquering the new world before the Catholics did. And therefore, you know, having the source of wealth from the new world. And, and he, he also conceptualized that in mythical terms. He thought that the new world had perhaps originally been colonized by King Arthur, that Elizabeth was the reincarnation of King Arthur, and that he was the reincarnation of Merlin, and that because of this, they had claim to the new world. And he thought that they would find the Garden of Eden there. He thought they would find the Northwest Passage, which was a hypothesized water passageway through North America to get to the West Coast. And so D basically said, look, you know, the, the key here, and he was absolutely right, as history bears out, at least from a purely, you know, economic sense, you know, the crimes of empire aside, he basically said that there needs to be a British Empire, which, again, is a phrase that he, he coined, which he said the phrase British Empire was given to him by the angel Michael. And he wrote a book called The General and Rare, Rare Memorials, which includes an alchemical engraving on the cover uh, of this five-volume set, which is, you know, a ship sailing from England to the New World with Elizabeth at the prow and the archangel Michael leading the ship forward, carrying a banner with a tetragrammaton on it to the, the new world of, of plenty, and uh, which would be not just a place to despoil, but would be, in Dee's vision, a way to, and then the later vision of Francis Bacon and the Rosicrucians, which became the foundational myth of America, would be a place to establish uh, an empire of free thinking away from the church and that uh, it would be an alchemical experiment where human beings could be spiritually perfected um, away from the grasp of Rome and the papacy. That idea obviously later became very important to Rosicrucians and Freemasons and the founding fathers of America. Mm -hmm. But uh, D argues for it for the first time uh, in the general and rare memorials and becomes uh, deeply involved in what we might consider kind of naval startups at this time, similar to, I guess, you know, private space startups now where he is kind of going into uh, private ventures with people where they're, they're investing, they're raising investment to finance private missions to the new world to look for gold or any other wealth they can get. And it's D that figures out, uh, D sends the privateer Sir Francis Drake to circumnavigate the tip of South America at this time and land in San Francisco at Drake's Bay, where you can still go, which is the first time anyone from Europe has been able to get to the west coast of America uh, in this way and show that it's possible. And it has to be a secret mission because he uh, has to go through uh, Spanish Catholic territory in Mexico and Central and South America in order to do it. But he's able, he lands there and it's a, a clandestine mission that they keep secret for 10 years. And it was by doing that that D was able to demonstrate the possibility of, of colonizing America. And, and Drake actually named, uh, landed at San Francisco and named it Nova, Nova Albion, New England, which, of course, they, the name, they recycled the name when they colonized the East Coast. But it was, you know, it was D. And D not only, by the way, not only gave the, and this is so mind-blowing to me, that we think of D as this kind of random kooky occult guy, right? And he's written out of the history. And we think of that because we're looking at him through the lens of hundreds of years of propaganda attacks and people wanting to bury his memory whether it's the church or, or mainstream science or whoever it happens to be. But this is to discover this, you know, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, unwrapping these layers of complexity, you see the footprint of this man on the world. And it's, it's shocking, right? So, yeah, I mean, it was from that work. And so he not only told Elizabeth there should be a British Empire, but he also, in this five-volume work, laid out the naval schematics necessary to do it because he had been so studied in naval science and optics in, in, in Europe. He invented this thing called a paradoxical compass, which allowed better navigation techniques. And he basically gave her not only the mythology of why it needed to happen, but also the, the hard data on how to do it. He basically argued that, you know, just like Rome had conquered the world by building roads everywhere, 
that England, even though it was this tiny and at this point completely impoverished, I mean, people were eating sawdust and and congealed animal blood uh, at this time. He argued that naval power was the key to English domination of the world. And he was right. And it was because of that insight that Protestantism spread around the world and that uh, North, that America, North America, Canada, and the United States became, for the most part, Protestant countries. Uh, and South America and Central America, of course, uh, were conquered by Spain and, uh, in some cases, France, and became Catholic countries. Uh, but if it hadn't been for John Dee, the entire Western Hemisphere would have been uh, Spanish uh, and Catholic, and it would have been the the Spanish. Uh, empire that would have won out in the Age of Empires instead of the British. And world history would look very different. Definitely, yeah. And, you know, that supernova that we mentioned earlier, D also thought that that foretold the arrival of one Edward Talbot in 1582. We've already mentioned who he actually is. That's obviously Ed Kelly. But where does Ed come from, Jason? And why does he show up in Mortlake to hang out with Dr. D? So you have to visualize this guy for a second, right? I mean, we think of, so Edward Kelly is a psychic, but he's also kind of this extremely criminal, dubious character who we might, you know, uh, compare to John Constantine, right? For modern, you know, people who are interested in the occult. But Kelly, you have to imagine is this, you know, kind of almost hobo type character. Like he's overweight. He has a skull cap that he wears to cover the fact that his ears are missing. He's had his ears cut off for for, uh, cozening or forging coins. And he brings with him this aura of just brimstone. You know, people have accused him of summoning corpses through necromantic rituals to learn their secrets, to um, that he's been conjuring demons and so on and so forth. And he's an alcoholic and he's only 25, but he is just this kind of stray cat and uh, beat up Alley Cat with this demonic aura around him. He shows up at Mortlake, which is Dee's kind of mansion, or, or at least, you know, estate, kind of, or, or what we would now consider just like a nice middle-class home, uh, on the bank of the River Thames in southwest London. And Dee, of course, is a respectable member of society. He has a wife. He has children. He is regularly uh, called upon at court. Elizabeth comes to visit him at Mortlake. And he's a member of the British establishment. And so this guy Kelly shows up, which he was calling himself Edward Talbot at that time. And he's half Dee's age. And he's been sent because Dee's been working with kind of a headhunter, if you will, like a a talent scout for Scryers uh, that he's had contact with in the the Elizabethan court. Has found this guy and sent him to Dee. And the uh, he, he, he comments that the moon turns blood red uh, the night that Kelly shows up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Kelly, he actually has been somewhat well educated. He's been to Oxford. Uh, he's probably a lot more intelligent than people remember him has or let on. But he's basically a wingnut psychic. And he's, he's you know, constantly drunk. He's constantly kind of having freak outs and bad, bad trips and episodes of paranoia or even extreme rage. But he can do it, right? He can scry. He has this aptitude that is unlike anything that D has ever seen, where he can put Kelly in front of a scrying glass and do some type of magical ritual. And what Kelly will come back with, he'll go into a trance and what he'll come back with is just beyond the quality of anything D has ever encountered. Like he can actually do it. And it's not, he's not just, at least in D's opinion, you know, he's either the best con man in occult history, including Crowley, or he's... Or he's actually telling the truth. He can actually, or both. You know, it could be both. So they form this working relationship where he puts Kelly on payroll and starts having him do scrying, you know, two to three times a day with some breaks for the next seven years. And what starts coming through is they, after some, you know, initial incidents where they start getting lots of demonic appearances, uh, afterwards they start to make contact with beings that purport to be the the archangel michael and the archangel gabriel who begin to transmit to them what we now consider the the enochian magical system and 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 then that becomes d's entire pursuit and kelly's entire pursuit over the next seven years and the rest of his life kind of falls apart it kind of already had fallen apart he'd lost he'd actually lost some standing at court because he had presented his imperial ideas 
and had kind of honestly been laughed out of court by the Secretary of State, William Cecil. They didn't take his ideas about the British Empire particularly seriously. And his payment, by the way, for coming up with the idea of the British Empire for the what, again, would become the, the greatest empire the world had ever seen, the, the, the richest empire the world had, had ever or has ever seen, uh, was a leg of venison given to him by uh, the Secretary of State. He got a, a piece of meat for the British Empire, and, and they, they laughed it out of court and didn't take him seriously. Of course, only a few years later, uh, they implemented almost all of his ideas, but Dee himself was quite tragically not recognized, and it is still not re- particularly recognized in the histories. Uh, the, the history books much more credit Walter Raleigh and a few other people with building that, but Dee lost his credit and was not paid. So his 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 career had already kind of fallen apart, and it's easy to argue that because of that, he retreated into the occult as kind of a world that he could still have control over and that he was still important in, which we often see in modern people today who get into the occult, you know, whether they realize it or not. So there's some psychological motivations you can argue for that where he kind of, and that's certainly how mainstream science has seen it. They, they say, they basically will all say, well, D was brilliant up to this, but he was clearly losing the plot and kind of, this is kind of a sad and sad old man trying to talk to angels. And it's, it's kind of a sad story, (laughs) but but then you read the material, and not only does it directly tie into everything that Dee has been doing, but it, it wraps up and is the crowning of all of his intellectual work. And the reason that is, is because the angels appear, and not only do they give him, they fulfill everything that we've been talking about right throughout this entire podcast. They give him the Ur language, they give him the, the true secrets of magic, and they... they basically look at all the prior hermetic material and the European grimoires and they kind of say, well, this is a a fumbling human attempt to reveal the real magic, which is what we're going to give you. They correct all of the the work of the unenlightened monkeys, as it were, and give them the true system of magic and the Ur language, which is Enochian, the Enochian language, the language spoken by angels. And then they tell D.M. Kelly, after about three or four years of just transmitting the system and the furniture, the the ritual implements needed to use it, they then tell them that this system is not for personal aggrandizement. It's to be used to hasten the apocalypse. It's to be used to bring the world closer to the second coming of Christ because Europe is at its is fallen and and everything has fallen apart and the and the world, the Antichrist is here and the end is nigh and the world must be wrapped up. And so they give them this system and what they tell them, and this piece of information really is the key of this entire book. And it's not just the key of this entire book, but it is the bit of context that forms the entire basis of the Western magical tradition, and yet, which you never read in any Western magical text, right? Which you, you never see in books on Enochian magic, uh, which is the big picture. And the big picture is awe-inspiring and terrifying in its grandiosity. And this is one of the reasons why I will say, you know, this book, you know, John Dee and the Empire of Angels, is, for, for reasons like this, tr- kind of truly is the Necronomicon. It seems like very, uh, you know, innocuous on the cover and has the says the word angels on it. And it seems like very nice. But, you know, you by the end of this 560 pages of this book, your your brain will be melting out of your ears and you will feel completely uncertain about anything in the world. Anyways, <laughs> so, yeah. What the angels say is that they want a a new world order. They want one world religion which will unify the fragmentary nature of Christendom. They want to unify Protestantism and Catholicism into one religion, but not just those, but also uh, Islam and Judaism and even paganism into one hermetic super religion. And, And this religion will be under the domination of the angels. And that people will be able to use the Enochian magical system and the furniture that they, the ritual implements that they've given Dee and Kelly, and those that those Enochian implements will be in every household, much like a you know a TV would later become. If you can imagine a world like that, where people have an Enochian scrying board instead of a TV, and that people will be able to use these to directly make contact with the angels. Uh, outside of, or I should say not outside of, but in addition to the institution of the church so that people get it right and they do submit to to God and, and begin to repair their sinful and fallen natures 
and that they will, you know, have the direct, you know, the broadband connection to the angels instead of just relying on what the local village, just what the local village priest says. They basically say, look, Christianity as a religion had its chance. It's falling apart. We're taking the wheel, right? You, you need stricter guidance, uh, as they do, you know, as they argue to Muhammad and various other people who claim to have made contact with angelic beings, whatever that actually is. But they say there should be a new world order, a hermetic super religion that will unite everyone on earth under the direct control with a direct interface to the angels. And that this should be grafted on to D's, you know, this is why they gave D the idea of the British Empire, which again comes from the angel Michael, who's the same being that gives them the Enochian system, where they say that, you know, you, you put in motion the plans for a world empire, that this empire will be grafted with this super religion and that it will be under uh, Elizabeth as a world sovereign instead of the Pope as a, a Anglican or Protestant world empress. And Elizabeth will control the entire planet with a, a terrestrial and spiritual world order that the angels will be directly in charge of. Now, that is an intense and uh, totalizing idea that when you understand you get the sense of the scale of what, what, what the Western magic tradition really is. And in addition to that, I will argue, perhaps, you know, one might argue, that even though this plan was not realized within Dee's time, and that Dee's efforts to bring it about were consistently frustrated, for instance, they, the angels told them to go to uh, Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor, and, and get him on board with this plan, and he kind of laughed them out of court, you know, D and, and again, you know, D was treated so poorly by uh, Cecil, the Secretary of State and the, the English court. You can argue that ideas have their own wings, their own life, if you will. And I think that if you look at the world through a glass darkly or through a scrying glass, perhaps just that we tilt it a little bit sideways and you look at things like the British Empire and the American Empire and the way that the British Empire spread Christianity across the entire world in the same way that uh, St. Paul spread Christianity from, from Jerusalem and, uh, and, and Israel in, into uh, the Catholic Church, which then conquered all of Europe. You can look at the way that John Dee's work was responsible for Christianity in its form as Protestantism and Anglicanism, then conquering the entire planet through the brutal mechanisms uh, of empire at the point of a sword. Just ask any uh, tribal group or other country that was, you know, just ask the Australian aboriginals or anyone who, or the, the native tribes, the original American tribes in North America who were genocided and then forced to convert at point of a sword or, or of chemical or, or biological warfare and forced into Christian schools. Ask anyone about that empire of angels and uh, take that up to our modern day and I think it's quite possible to argue that the final form of Protestantism and the, the Protestant work ethic is is global capitalism and then globalization. And I think that if you look just in the right way, you might be able to see that that plan just might have worked out more than people think it did. Definitely, yeah. And I want to bring back uh, Pico's work just for a moment because I'm I'm curious. You know, he had grouped angels into three categories, a hierarchy of sorts, the seraphim, the cherubim, and the thrones. The angels that Dee and Kelly were speaking with, were they not part of that, that hierarchy? Were they even higher than that? So this is a this is an important technical point. So there's a traditional schema of angelology that comes from Pseudo Dionysus, the Arapagite, and uh, in the sixth century, and that was later adopted by uh, a Catholic theologians like Thomas Aquinas, and also Saint Augustine touches upon it. Well, actually, I'm, I take that back. Augustine is earlier than Pseudo Dionysus, but Saint Thomas Aquinas definitely adopts it, and it has become part of the teachings of, and still to this day, part of the teachings of the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Church. And that's that there are nine ranks of angels with seraphim and cherubim at the top, uh, followed by, you know, power uh, thrones and dominions and powers and principalities, uh, all the way down to the lower two ranks of angels, which are archangels and angels. And those are traditionally given the name, you know, Hebrew names with the, the suffix L, which is Aleph Lamed in Hebrew, and, um, you know, depicted often quite innocuously as just, you know, beings with white robes and wings. And sometimes they're a little rosy-cheeked, right? So D 
and Kelly, in making contact with angels, found quite a different reality because the beings that they contacted outside of their initial contact with Michael and Gabriel who, and, and, uh, and also uh, Uriel and Raphael, which we now see in the Lesser Banishing Ritual of the Pentagram, which comes out of Dee's work in the five books, you know, the, the five books of mystery. We see these beings first appearing like traditional archangels, but as the sessions go on, not only do they give their names in Enochian, which are completely different from, or the angelic language as it were, which are completely different from Hebrew, but they do not conform to, to, to traditional ranks and they are look completely bizarre. Now, that said, for the most part, you can kind of look at these, you, you can kind of do a little retrofitting and it seems that for the most part, the beings they're interacting with are just from the two lower ranks of angels. With, as the sessions go on, they start to get things that you might argue seem like from the book of Ezekiel or wings of uh, wheels of wings and things like this that are consistent with higher uh, rankings of angels. But it's not like a one-to-one correspondence is given. And the beings that they're seeing are just bizarre, right? They're like something from um, Jacob's Ladder or a Clyde Barker painting. And instead of getting, you know, rosy-cheeked cherubs, what they're getting is beings with multiple pupils in each eye with fire coming out of their mouths or giants with the the heads of suns and pillars of brass for legs. Uh, At one point, they're given a vision of God and God appears to them not as a not as a, a wise old man with a flowing white beard, but as a gigantic whale covered with eyes whose mouth is a cavern from which amidst this howling which they go into and are swallowed up by. The, the sessions are full of things like that. And it's just, you read this stuff, it, it's impossible not to be profoundly shaken and affected by that. And it's kind of like, well, if they were making this up, they were doing a pretty good job of it. The other thing is, most of the angels that they meet are female. So they start meeting female angels like uh, Galva and Medimi. And this comes as a, as a shock to them because uh, Trithemius actually argues quite vociferously that, that angels always appear as male. And that uh, female angels must be demonic apparitions. Of course, there's quite a lot of, you know, misogynist and perhaps patriarchal mm-hmm. attitudes at work there. But the angels show up and they're, they're often female. And Medimi is like a small, playful girl uh, who changes appearance and seems to grow up every time that they, they contact her. But the angels assure them that, oh, no, no, that's not true. You know, angels quite often appear as female but can appear in whatever gender they want. And which I'm sure female practitioners will be quite interested to hear. And this is this is another reason why it's like it's hard to say that they're I don't know, like the, the angels as they appear, they don't they, they completely buck everything that has been said about angels prior to that. And they're often quite erotic in some senses. And particularly by the end, of course, the one of the final apparitions in the spirit diaries is the appearance of the daughter of fortitude, who is the the horror of Babylon from the book of Revelation and, of course, becomes Babylon in, in Crowley's system, who, you know, a, appears to them and gives them this 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 uh, chilling speech, you know, where she says, you know, I am the first and the last and and the whore and the holy one. And, and I can pull it up and recite it, but it's I'm sure a lot of occult people already know it. It's the most famous speech from the entire uh, spirit diaries. And uh, it's it's it, by the way almost word for word and tonally almost exactly similar to the Gnostic scripture, Thunder Perfect Mind, which was not even excavated until, I believe, uh, 1947 or 1949, and they had no way of reading it. And that, that uh, you know, the Thunder Perfect Mind from the, you know, the second or third century AD, which is about the goddess Sophia in her aspect as both a uh, whore and holy one, and and basically the goddess Babylon speaking from the perspective of the fe- the divine female, but from the weary perspective of, of the female God of the weariness of having to bear humanity and bear men and bear being the, the sink for the, uh, the karmic sink for the sin and suffering of humanity as women so often end up unfortunately in the position of, or if you imagine the, the haunted look of pain in the eyes of of a streetwalker like this is this is the being that they're contacting with and uh it's too you know they freak out it's too much for them they're these two christian guys in 16th century england 
So yeah, so so but yeah, where do you stick that in a in a classic Catholic <laughs> angelic hierarchy? You can't, you know. So you just kind of yeah. got to roll with it. Yeah. So while we're still on the angels for a moment, I think Ulysses maybe had a question about them. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out if it's true that this this uh, angelic magic is the axis where the rest of the Western magical tradition. What assurance do we have that the place the angels want to take humanity is beneficial for us well we don't (laughs) you know we just don't i think that the thing about enochian magic is you you need to approach it from the context of you know almost literal old testament christianity right you need to approach it from the context of the revealed scripture of the bible and perhaps the quran and and the other end, you have to see it as part of, you know, I see D and Kelly's work not less as part of the occult continuum than as part of the, the continuum of, you know, uh, received monotheistic documents and transmissions like the Book of Revelation or the Quran or the various other ones. That is something that's kind of been ignored by later occult movements. The Golden Dawn, you know, made their patchwork version where they stuck it into Egyptology and tarot and all this. And then Crowley made his own version that became the core of the Thelemic, you know, system, if you will. Although for him, you know, he he quite quickly zeroed in on the Daughter of Fortitude or Babylon as the center of the whole thing, which I think is probably accurate. But the short answer is we don't. And I think that. In writing this book, I have not come out and said, you know, I'm not, there's never a point in this book where I'm telling people to do this, right? I'm never saying like, oh, well, this is the ultimate be all end all of magic and you've got to do this or, you know, this is the next big thing. And if you don't, you know, you're not a magician or whatever, like not at all. What I've done is call attention to what this thing is and how much it has causally shaped Western history, particularly when you think about the assumptions that come not just from D, but from evangelical Christianity as it was being born in its literal kind of turbocharged form at this time in England and in the coming decades. You can't do anything but realize that it is causally formed, in many senses, the modern world. Now, you know, the intentions of the angels, I'm just just some guy in a Hawaiian shirt, right? Like, I can't, I can't, I can't tell you. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. people uh, can't, can't see you right now, but you actually are wearing a Hawaiian shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is my, my, you know, yeah, yeah. When I'm not wearing robes and occult rings and listening to Coil, it's just a Hawaiian shirt. No, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm extremely unspooky. But um, what we can do is, you know, I, I think we can without question argue that, turbo, you know, apocalyptic Christianity, as I argue in this book, or dispensationalist Christianity in the, is what it's been called since the 19th century, which is what informs the evangelical right in America now, which you can see as part of a continuum from, from D and certainly the creation of the British Empire, and also in which Crowley plays quite a much more critical role than people realize in the script of evangelical Christianity, not, not, not just the occult. You know, we can argue the, the, the suffering that has come out from that is incalculable. You know, when, when we tally the crimes of the British Empire or, you know, the footprint of the American Empire or, you know, the fact that for, it was only in the 1980s that Ronald Reagan was holding and, 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 of course, Gorbachev, but Ronald Reagan was holding the entire world uh, hostage at the point of a nuclear warhead while claiming that it, we truly were in the end days and that it was his job as a soldier of Christ to shepherd the world through the confrontation with the evil empire of Russia, which is like the Gog and Magog in the book of Daniel. So people take this quite seriously, not just D, of course, but evangelical, you know, turbo Christianity in general. And they're the people in charge. And, you know, again, bombs are falling in Syria. And they, they talk about, like I always think about, when people look at the book of Revelation and they say, well, this is just some crazy psychedelic trip or, or, you know, you know, this is silly. It's like, well, maybe, but it's also something people have taken quite seriously for almost 2000 years. And those are people with power and weapons, whether we believe it or not, tends to take a back seat to the fact that the people in power seem to people like Mike Pence or Donald Rumsfeld during the, the Bush administration and George, George Bush, the second who, you know, told when he was trying to get support for the war in Iraq, told Jacques Chirac in France that he saw Gog and Magog at work in the Middle East. I mean, this is craziness. 
it's 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 craziness, but it's craziness that is in control. And this is why I've tried to point it out. And um, you know, again, it's like you look at the Book of Revelation. I mean, I have pulled up right here in front of me Revelation, I believe nine seven, which is about the opening of the pit of Abaddon and Apollyon, and and it says that from this pit. This is during the time when all sinners on earth will be punished by avenging angels. Uh, it says here, the shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months, and they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. So you can look at this, and you can see it as you know some silly scripture written in the first century. But I look at that, and I, I see drones, and Apache helicopters, and phos- white phosphorus bombs, and, and death raining down from above from locusts. Uh, with breastplates of iron. And I, I think if you just imagine yourself in one of these war zones being inhumanly and in, indiscriminately killed, then we see the end of the world. And when we understand that these things are not random, but in many cases have been engineered with the idea of you know making this real somewhere in the code, uh, somewhere in the back of somebody's mind, or quite literally with the idea that you know, it is for some reason the job of the people in power to make this happen. And I mean, again, just today or last night, we, we began to bomb Syria. So unfortunately, this has become all too relevant yet again. But if you read in uh, Isaiah 17, Isaiah 17, one, I just found this morning uh, prophecies, the destruction of, of Damascus uh, as a necessary forerunner for the second coming. It says, The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. So what we have here is people reading a book and taking it as a as a recipe book. You know, a book that you might argue was simply a book of metaphors for about the battle of good and evil in a human's heart. But instead of seeing it as a metaphor, they've taken it as a recipe book and a guidebook. How to fix the world. Well the way you fix the world is is bringing about the end of the world so that it prompts Christ coming back because that's how we're going to fix this. Well, I, I mean, you know, take of that what you will. I think that if you're a completely secular person, you would react to this with nothing but utter horror. The lunatics are running the asylum. So in that case, you know, make, make your own decision about whether this is a good idea or not. Well, I don't know. I'm trying to, I don't know if it's a, you can, can maybe figure out a question out of what I'm trying to figure out, but like it, it's it seems to me that the angels are incapable of implementing their agenda without some kind of intercession from human beings. So that has to say something with about what kind of power we hold as individuals, because John D was just he was a guy. I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what the question is, but I'm, I'm trying to talk around it to figure it out. No, I think that's a really important point. And that's also something that you see in the records where the angels can goad human beings and suggest and bribe and even threaten in some cases, but they can't override human free will. And that you can see that by the fact that they constantly have problems, not just with Dee and Kelly, but they're constantly trying to get various European monarchs to do things or, uh, you know, minor nobles or even kind of shady figures like Albert Lasky, who's this character that they get wrapped up with. They're trying to use them as pawns, but they can't force them to do anything. So a lot of times people just go off script and this becomes a, a point of a lot of contention and, and upset for the angels And I think that from their perspective, you know, the reason that humanity, you might argue the reason humanity suffers so much is because they won't go along with the plan. The angels are basically like, look, we have this perfect plan for the salvation of all humanity and you guys sleep in and you're more interested in money than your souls. And you won't you won't you won't take any action to further your spiritual progress. And in fact, the word the angels have for humanity is whores. 
and they mean that not in the sexual sense, but they mean that out of frustration in the sense that human beings will, from their perspective, focus on literally anything other than God, whether it's, uh, you know, money or their career or family or, or, you know, some meaningless diversion, some, you know, in our current, current era, you know, some meaningless social media or video game or, you know, idle chatter. And, and the angels are quite furious with humans. And it becomes tragic when you realize also throughout reading the diaries how heartbroken they are. You know, they come on strong. They come on, you know, quite furious. But you begin to see throughout the diaries how heartbroken they are at the state of humanity and the fallen nature of humanity and how every time they try to get humanity to figure it out and work it out and fix things, it doesn't work because humans are kind of essentially animal and they, they're, they're not up to the task. Even D, who's the smartest person and perhaps in the, all of Europe at this time, even he is not up to the task. Even he is, you know, asking the angels for money and not showing up to sessions and, you know, getting distracted and not following orders. So, you know, if even D can't get on script with them, kind of what hope do they have? And at least that's kind of something you get from the sessions. And, and that becomes quite, quite tragic because you can see that, you know, even in this time period, they're trying to get things sorted out and trying to fix the damage that humanity has done to itself through sin. And they can't do it. And here we are. It's, you know, it's 2018 and uh, over 500 years later. And um, we're still, you know, we progress technologically we have weapons that can destroy, as I said, all life on Earth many times over in a flash. But we're still the same people. We're still just as, or perhaps more so, because people don't even really have religion in their, as a guiding force in their life anymore. They're just ruled completely by their urges and their their lower nature, which is catered to, you know, by everything in the modern world, rather than the condition of our souls. And so I think that you could argue that humans are much less spiritually advanced than we were even in, in Elizabeth's time and uh, less intellectually advanced also in some ways. And I, I mean that in the sense of, you know, a, a great example that the, the, the magician E.E. E. Remus once brought up is that if you think about Elizabeth's England and the fact that uh, Shakespeare, you know, the plays of William Shakespeare were performed for the common audience, that was really like you know, the Netflix binge watching of its day. I mean, those plays were created as high art, but high art that could be enjoyed by every level of society from, you know, the nobility to the common people. And uh, it was art for the masses. And, it, you know, Shakespeare is, you know, perhaps the, the apex of the use of the English language. But you think about now today, it's been 500 years later and 500 years of increasing material comfort, you know, the ability to get food whenever we want, shelter for most people. Not all people, but most people, much more than before when people were, again, eating sawdust and congealed animal blood in England. And you consider that we have had 500 years of technological advance and computers and the ability to bring up any information at any time into our hand, into a phone, or communicate with people and do things that you could only theoretically do by using the grimoires of Trithemius or Agrippa, you know, all the things they tried to do with magic, we could now do with technology in the blink of an eye, and we take it completely for granted. You know, you can summon whatever you want to appear tomorrow through Amazon Prime uh, or communicate with anyone in the world telepathically, as it were, through the medium of technology. Or we can have this conversation or I can sit in my apartment and beam my, my, my thoughts into the heads of everyone listening to this or anyone can do this. Yet... But where are we? And you think about somebody now just having all this access to comfort and information and all this. We look at just at Shakespeare's plays. People can barely read Shakespeare now. Barely. And I don't mean just uh, the, the archaic nature of the language, but the levels of subtlety and the insight into human nature that it requires to, you know, we can watch PewDiePie, <laughs> but we can't understand Shakespeare. <laughs> and, and, and that's not that far away from us in history. You know, or if you look at just the, the quality of, you know, just it was, it was, you know, I remember in my lifetime and I'm, I'm fairly young, you know, I remember in my lifetime when people still talk to each other on the street and interacted with people in the real world and had messy but human experiences on a regular basis. 
before everything was just online and completely controlled and regimented and monitored. Now we live in a monitored prison, a monitored, controlled, and air-conditioned nightmare as Arthur Miller or somebody, I think, the air-conditioned nightmare as Arthur Miller. I could have that wrong. But, uh, you know, not just an air-conditioned nightmare as America was in the 50s, but a, an electronic prison. So, is that progress? I'm not sure. I think that it's um, perhaps, you know, the apocalypse is not an event, but an ongoing process, as, as many have said. So, it seems to me that occult practice is more focused on the internal apocalypse to just sort of transform or transmute the self and its experience here. So the last thing I want to ask you is the external world looks bleak at times, as you've just outlined, but are we headed toward even bleaker times? And if so, are 8 billion internal apocalypses necessary to avoid it? I don't know. I mean, I just, I, you know, as a human being, I just don't know. I think that spirituality as a general category is a painkiller, right? In the same way that opiates are. And spirituality, for the most part, is a way of practicing techniques for enlightenment type experiences, but also for understanding life better and contextualizing your experience so that it becomes meaningful and not just random and chaotic and wasted. Because for most people, the events of their life are cruel collection of unfortunate events. And the gift of spirituality is the ability to contextualize a life as having meaning. And sometimes it can do that too well and, and lead people into delusion. But I think that the role of spirituality, if, if I can be so caustic, perhaps, is not necessarily to fix things, but it is to understand things and come to grips with them. And ultimately, I think that if you do, certainly if you do magic right, and I don't necessarily just mean Enochian magic, but if you do magic, and if, certainly if you do meditation correctly, I think you come to a place where the assumptions of you know, the mythology of magic and the assumptions of spirituality kind of disintegrate. And this is, of course, something that we might call the abyss or initiation into Bina or, or whatever you want to call it, which I talk about in the book. And you're, you know, I, I say often, people very often, as you might imagine, ask me, what is magic? And I say, well, stage magic, right, is when uh, somebody creates an illusion, pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Uh, real magic you know, the role of a real magician is to take illusions away until you're stripped naked in front of the infinite and you can't look away from what is right in front of your face. I think that I will say that the experiences like the ones that come through real spiritual practice, whether it's magic or many of the other esoteric paths or, uh, you know, many other routes that may not even be traditionally called spiritual, but growing and evolving as a, as a, living human being, one who is aware and intent on growing, as most people are not, I think you do come to a position where you realize perhaps that the Calvary is not coming. And most people on this planet, since the dawn of human history, have killed the pain of existence by telling themselves myths about people in the, some person in the sky will come fix it, right? Or God or angels or whatever it happens to be. And I think that when you go through the magical path, you see that these things are real to some extent. But then you see that, you know, as the Buddhists would say, ultimately, it's just more Maya. It's just another level of illusion. The whole, the, the whole magical world, the whole occult world, all of it, right? All the astral experiences and synchronicities and apparent causal connections and numerology and gematria and the illusion, the delusion that you're somehow progressing and growing, whether that's through a grade structure or whatever it happens to be, or that you have special knowledge, it's all illusion. It's just another level of, of maya or samsara, right? It's an internal samsara, uh, one that emerges out of the unconscious. I think that if you push it far enough, you come to the conclusion that all we have is you know, I think that almost all of the human experience is just illusory. And I think you come to a conclusion that, well, you know, as, as Krishnamurti argued, Jiddu Krishnamurti, 
you know, where he says that, you know, I mean, you come to a point where you realize that the world is a madhouse run by people who believe fairy tales and that the assumptions of spirituality are in most cases delusional, but that come to a place where you realize that this is kind of all we have in terms of we have this experience right now and we don't really know what it is, but we have each other and we have the ability to be what appears to be awake and conscious and the ability to do what appears to be exercise free will. So we quite ought to get on with the business of being kind to each other because there's the world is made up of so much suffering and people must go through so much. And, and so at least I've come to a position, a place in my life where I think that to grow as a human being, let alone some type of grandiose spiritual thing, but just to grow as a human being, we have to embody the qualities that we get from the mythology, right? Instead of trying to perhaps contact some supernatural being that we should embody and become what the best parts of these things, we have to be the hero, right? We have to be the, the savior. And I don't mean that again in some kind of a grandiose or messianic thing. It's like save yourself, sort it out. And do what you can to sort out life for the people around you, not in a coercive way, but in a way that actually helps. And I think that if we're to really deal with, and what I would truly argue is if we're to deal with this crisis that we're in, with the fact that we are approaching breaking point in terms of population on this planet and lack of, you know, we're going to run out of barring some technological solution, we're going to be facing some very hard realities about resources and energy, and uh, waste, and population density, and things like this, and the environment, and the fact that the ice caps are melting far faster than we thought they were, and all the animals are dying, and we don't even realize it, as, as I saw the other day, because, you know, we're constantly being shown images of, of endangered animals in the media, but in many cases, these are animals that don't even exist anymore, you know, or barely exist, and we get a false illusion from the reality that things are okay, because that's the business of the media, but they are anything but. But I think that, were I to argue anything, I think that the, the way out of that is not to, A, think that somebody else will come fix it, and B, for the love of whatever you might call God, is not to try to make it worse, as people have been doing for 500 years, uh, to accelerate it in the f idea that we'll get through it faster, or as Dante argued in the, the Inferno, the way out is through. I think this is utterly fallacious thinking. And I, this is why I've tried to call so much attention to it in this book. The way out is not through, because uh, it can always get worse, and particularly as, as technology gets worse and worse and worse, uh, or not worse necessarily, but more and more powerful. I think that we need to quite soberly look at the world and, and deal with it as adults, and I think that part of becoming an adult is letting go of your illusions. And I think that's one thing that magic, if done appropriately, can actually be quite good at in kind of a roundabout way, which is it allows you to move through these strong delusions, if you will, as an experimenter and reduce them to dust and, and reduce yourself to dust, as, you know, as, as the, the goddess Babylon says, of those who enter the city of pyramids. You have to realize the illusory nature of reality and then the emptiness of reality, of any inherent meaning, that there's any real script, that anyone knows what's going on, that anyone is an adult or at the wheel. You have to realize that it's, a, it's empty, it's an illusion. But then you have to realize that at the same time, we're all here. We're all as real as whatever real is. That's where we're here, you know, and, and we're here as a network of conscious beings who seem to all be in this together in this place whatever this place is and that we all suffer quite terribly and we should quite have kindness and compassion uh, for each other and then we should get on with figuring out and i think that as i've argued on other podcasts i think that uh we're, we're going to need good technological solutions for dealing with the environmental crisis and you know like we we need sober real solutions for our problems not praying to Sky Daddy to come fix it and certainly not trying to accelerate the worsening of global conditions to make Sky Daddy come faster. Yeah, I could not agree with you more. And I think that's a good note to wrap up our main discussion on. So before we move into some Patreon bonus material here, tell people where they can find the book and keep up with your work. 
Okay, so the book is coming out Tuesday, so April the 17th. You can go to johnd007.com uh, to learn more about the book and read an excerpt. You can also just, look, I mean, if you Google John D, on, or excuse me, if you search John D on Amazon, it'll, it'll be the first thing that comes up. It's called John D and the Empire of Angels. Uh, and you can keep up with me at jasonlouv.com. So Jason, L-O-U-V dot com, one word. And you can follow all my social media there, Twitter, Instagram. And I also have a, a free course on, on uh, magic and meditation. And all my other stuff is there, too. So that's the best place. And there you have it. Holy shit. Jason Louvre bringing that alchemical fire. If you haven't pre-ordered his book yet or ordered it, if you're hearing this after it's released, well, you are definitely missing out on maybe the book of 2018. It's that good, it's that important, and it's that necessary. And this right here was just a small sample of it, but I think we did a good job of giving you an appetizer for what may be, again, the main course of occult culture this year. And if you are interested in grabbing Jason's book, the links are in the show notes. You may have noticed I mentioned some Patreon bonus material at the end there. Jason hung around for about another 15 minutes, and we did some sort of rapid-fire questions about Dee's watchtowers, which are a central part of the Enochian system, and also about Dee's legacy and his impact on the Rosicrucians and guys like Aleister Crowley and Jack Parsons. And that's available for all patrons, starting at just 2 bucks a month. This is the first time that I've done a Patreon extension of sorts, but I will be doing more of that, and they will get longer as I continue to figure out how and what I want those features to look like. And if you feel frisky, do what Ulysses did and get in at 20 bucks a month because you'll have chances to sit in on calls with guests like Jason and be part of the conversation. So patreon.com slash occulture if you want to get in on that action. You know, D is one of the reasons that I'm actually here right now. And I was so hyped up to have this chat with Jason. And we actually just recorded this on Saturday, April 14th. I normally don't release episodes this quickly after they're recorded, but I woke up that morning and heard of Art Bell's passing. And Art is another reason I'm here right now. And I had some different things actually planned for this episode because of the content and because of Dee's impact on my own way of thinking. You know, I very much gravitate toward Hermeticism and that worldview, so Dee's work, as you might imagine, really, I guess, further opened up my eyes to the possibility of the human experience. But the first person to really do that was Art Bell, and not only did he open my eyes and my mind, he also did that for a lot of other folks, some of you included, I'm sure. When you hear people talk about the great radio personalities, Art Bell is rarely mentioned unless you actually heard him late at night. And if you did hear him, he was near or at the top of that list. And honestly, if it wasn't for him, this genre of podcasts isn't quite the same. I'm probably not here. Not that that matters a whole lot in the grand scheme of things. But there are probably some other podcasters who you enjoy who wouldn't have found the courage to take a chance on themselves or writers or filmmakers or musicians or truck drivers or teachers or teenagers or anyone who was awake at 2.30 in the morning on a Wednesday night wondering about the nature of the world they live in and the nature of the world inside of themselves. And if this conversation with Jason Louv was any indication, we need more regular folks to find that inspiration and that courage to take a chance on themselves. Anyway, I do hope you enjoyed this show, but it's time for me to go. For now. Until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. If we haven't made news tonight, then you haven't been listening. From the high desert, I'm Art Bell. Good night. Good night.